founder and director of Bath and beyond a program focused on empowering teenage mothers she is a professional banker a consultant on matters micro lending women economic empowerment group management and credit management with at least nine years of experience and from the intro you know it's bound to be a great 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 discussion karibu sana thank you very much you're welcome to it, y254 it's a pleasure to be here and it's a pleasure for you to have me karibu oh, sana God. thank you so let's just start from what is bath and beyond uh well bath and beyond is a program that uh as per your introduction that focuses on teenage mothers and uh probably just as a question normally i ask that um, when was the last time you heard about teenage mothers you know, most of the time when we talk about teenage mothers, it's only when we have statistics about uh, teenage pregnancy that has been, uh, that, are, that are out there, or any time we have our national exams. And uh, normally you find that most of, around that time, many people normally would want to ask a question is, how can we prevent uh, teenage pregnancy? But no one focuses on the ones who are already pregnant. So teenage, teenage I mean, uh, Bath and Beyond is about focusing on young mothers and basically just giving them help and uh, our mission, vision is creating safe spaces for teenage mothers. When yes. did you start? When did you start Bath and Beyond? When? Uh, Bath and Beyond was born many years ago. I was a teenage mother myself. Oh. Yeah. So um, let me say around 2011, I was still in the corporate circles because I no longer work in the banking sector. Uh, I used to I used to ask myself, is this is it is this it? You know. And for me, it was about uh, just asking myself, uh, where am I headed to? So Bath and Beyond was born in 2011 when I decided that I really want to focus on uh, teenage mothers and uh, because I was big and I'm big in women empowerment. So I felt that it was right for me to focus on a particular area. And for me, focusing on teenage mothers, it was really a right time because it's both from a personal experience and really there's such a great gap as far as young mothers are concerned. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I am tempted to ask. Yes. <laughs> I'm tempted to ask the story about being a teenage mother. Uh -huh. Please do. Tell us about it. If you if you don't mind. Uh -huh. no, I no, love no. stories. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I don't mind. For me it was what do I say? I, I had I had a friend and one thing led to another, what do I say? I just found yeah. myself expectant. Just immediately after I finished form four. And um at that time, it was really difficult. I took quite a long time before I even told anyone that I was actually pregnant. Um, it was a bit tough because for me, I was brought up. My mother was, though she passed on a few years back, she was a disciplinarian. So it was really tough. How do we have this conversation? You know, how do I tell her that I'm expectant? So what did I do? I wrote a letter. One morning, I escorted her to the road because she would walk like a kilometer to the road before she took a... Uh, the vehicle to go to school as she used to teach and then I gave her the letter and then I told her that I'm going to go away for two weeks and then after two weeks she needs to decide within those two weeks what she wants to do with me and for me I was like whatever happens I'll just take it in stride mm. so after two weeks probably after three weeks there I came back home I went to my cousin's place for around two weeks so when I came back the first question my mother asked me like after two three days have you started going to the clinic and that was it and oh. that was it yeah that was it I mean, I think sometimes there's nothing we can do. Yeah. It has already happened. Yeah. Sort of Kim Chapa. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. Yeah. Have you started going to the clinic? Wow. So how was it? How, what, what challenges did you go through as a teenage mom? The biggest, which is still happening right now, is stigma associated with teenage pregnancy. There's a lot of stigma. So, and you know, the gossip around the village is like, oh, so-and-so's daughter is pregnant, you know, and then people just are castigating you and all that. So that was really difficult for me. And sometimes when you're just walking to on the road and you're car carrying my heavy burden of pregnancy, you know, was really, really tough. Then again, going to the hospital, just facing the doctors and the nurses, it is really difficult because at that time, it was a very friendly environment. Then, of course, your, your, my, my, my friends, uh, we've just finished high school. They're hanging out all over the place. Me having not to stay at home and take care of my baby. It was really tough that way. But then um, what I'm really happy about is that I had a lot of support from my family. And uh, I remember I gave birth in October. And in January, I was back to school. Mm. Yeah, for my first diploma. 
yeah so it was a bit easy on the fact that i had support from my family but then even just to internally the internal struggles and the external struggles from the society and so on and so forth that was a bit tough that was oh, a wow. bit tough and even having to breastfeed at a young age really it's not easy wow. yeah it's not easy wow. yeah <laughs> mm. hey that was that was quite that was quite nice see where the passion to start bath and beyond yes. uh, emanates from yes. Um, how how many uh, so far? How many teenage mothers have you dealt with? Um, for me, let me explain this. Huh? Mm -hmm. We've we've I, I normally hold uh, events, huh? uh, and the events we hold like three or four events in a year as a program in an area called Gataka in Ongatarongai. So what we do, we invite just girls from all over the place. And sometimes we have even young girls who are not yet pregnant, and we have other girls who are already pregnant, and some who are teenage mothers. So sometimes you'll find that we hold events even for 120, 200. Like this Saturday, we hold, held an event which had 214, 15 girls thereabout. So those mass events, normally we distribute pads and diapers and clothes and food and all that, anything we are able to get. So through those events, I've been able to reach over 1,500 girls. However, from the larger group of girls, I normally select like 30, between 30 and 20 girls to work with a longer journey. Because you realize it's not easy, it's not a, your every day for a 14, 13 year old to get pregnant. So normally we work a journey with them where we take them through counseling and mentorship. And during the counseling, we have a counselor who works with them and be able just to, just to help them, just be able to understand what they are going through and all that. Then we give them mentorship. And during the mentorship session is where we normally teach them all these things, self-awareness, self-esteem, negotiation skills, uh, you know, breastfeeding, nutrition, and so on and so forth. We have a curricula that we normally follow. So for them, we work with them a journey of three months or six months. So through those, every, every other three months or six months, I'm working with 30 girls who we at, at least on a monthly, weekly basis, we normally meet. So, so far I've been able to reach over 1,500 girls. Yeah, through both both ways, both both sides of intervention. Oh, yeah. that's that's quite a big number, yeah, though. It, it Ooh. Is. Yeah, it is. Hey. It is. But, but um, it's just um, came to me as a concern the other day as I was doing news that there is a very big rise of uh, teenage mothers. I remember in um, my former high school, uh, somewhere. Somewhere. Yeah, somewhere. <laughs> uh -huh. They were recording when we left. Uh -huh. I left about eight eight years ago, and they were recording. We had like six, seven girls who were pregnant, and that was the biggest number. And you know, the stigma was, was something else because we kept looking at them and we were like, Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then now uh -huh. it has risen to 105 oh, recently. Okay. So we, that time, eight years ago, it was like seven. We was they, they were seven. Now it is the hundred and five. What do you what will you attribute to that rapid increase of teenage pregnancies? Mm -hmm. What I'll say is that it's it's a whole lot of issues. I wouldn't allude it to one particular issue. But what I say one is that there is a bit of a breakdown in family and social structure. You find that a long time ago, uh, taking care of a child was basically a societal approach. There was a societal approach. But nowadays you find that uh, parents, we are out there working, which is still okay, and we are busy just out there. So probably in the morning, you leave at 6 in the morning, back at 8 in the evening. So you find even that, that point of mentorship and connection with your child does not exist. So many of us are just on the grind and just all over. So you find that the child has been left to the school to be able to work with them and to be able to mentor them. And sometimes we will think that the school is a one-stop shop place that's supposed to provide everything that that child needs. So you find that there is a disconnect at the family front. Uh, long time ago, you'll find that sometimes you find that even if it's your teacher who finds you on the wrong, they're actually willing to thrash you right there. If it is anyone, you know, the society was concerned about the upbringing of a child. But nowadays you find it's up to you as a parent to, to get to know how and what to be able to do. So you find on that uh, on that angle, there's, there's, a, there's a bit of a gap on that. Then again, you also find that uh, there's a lot of information on social media. You find that, uh, and, and you know, they, I mean, there's a wealth of information, and some of it is negative. So you find that sometimes children are really growing up very fast because they have access to internet, and they can ask all these questions and get all these answers, get all these ideas also. 
So there is also that kind of an influence. And basically you find that, um, you know, that influences a child to be able to move into early sexual encounter. And again, now that leads to, you know, to teenage pregnancy. Oh, yeah. Well, it's te teenage pregnancy is, is is a whole mm. is a whole lot yeah. of discussion. Yeah. What is the worst case you've dealt with? Um, well, the worst case I've dealt with, I came across it this year. We have um, we have within the larger group of girls we are supporting, we have a young girl who is uh, who is uh, who is uh, how how I don't know how to put it. She's she's uh, she's mentally challenged, and uh, she's around 13, 14 years, and she's expectant. Mm -hmm. When I get to hear her story, no, she gave birth this month. Actually, she gave birth to a girl. When I get to when I got to hear about her story, she she because she does not have a parent who is taking care of her, who is providing for her. You find that uh, the way in which she can be able to earn an income or money or upkeep is by going out um, to, to, for sexual transaction. And from that, she's given 200 shillings. So, and she goes on and goes on and goes on. So she, she became ex pregnant and she's challenged. And she's, you know, her mother is also, you know, challenged to, to, to say the least. And she, she does, she's, she's not living in a really supportive family structure. So for me, that was a really, that was a really such a depressing state because I looked at her and I was like, okay, fine, what happens? Even after she gives birth right now, we are trying to find out how else can we be able to support her. The other really, the other, the other uh, really sad part or rather sad case that I came across was also a young girl who was probably, she's currently in grade five, who was defiled. And uh, just trying even to follow up who defiled her. It's a, it's a relative. And sometimes I look at that girl and I'm like, we don't even have the right clothes for that girl to be able to wear when she's breastfeeding. Because you find that sometimes she, she wears clothes that are, you know, a dress that is, you know, and then, you know, just trying even to remove her breast to be able to breastfeed. And I look at it like that and it's really saddening, you know, and just imagining who is this who looked at this girl and just saw a woman who you can be able to, you know, I mean, come on, you know. Mm. So some of those cases are really depressing. You know, they're quite a number, but those two really depressed me for a, for a while there. Ooh. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Hey. Today in the morning I was asking people uh -huh. um, when was the last time you cried? Okay. And 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 now you're saying that I feel like crying. I'm like today will be the, day the last time I cried. <laughs> <laughs> Can see again it's still looking at me. So I'm like who does that yeah, to a child? Yeah, who does that? Who does that? What? So um is it is it do you have a partnership? with authorities such that if you find the perpetrators you are able to forward them or how does it work okay it's a whole conundrum let me say that huh? mm -hmm. so sometimes there's a program we choose to focus on the girl and what we can be able to do for the girl and the kind of interventions we can be able to actually do for her mm. however because we don't work alone uh, we have community health volunteers we have people who are in the League of Fraternity. So sometimes you find that all these people, because all of us are focused and working in the same area, you find that everyone is doing what they can. So yes, we have partners who are in different spaces. So we are always trying to work together and find out how can we be able to help this person. Mm -hmm. So we can only do it through referral. And you do, if you are in the League of Fraternity and you look for, and normally you give legal uh, intervention, so follow that as far as this case is concerned. Personally, I'm doing counseling, mentorship, and giving them dignity kits, etc., etc. That is what we do. Yeah. So we work in a partnership just to be able to help the same person. But okay. as a program, we do not follow the legal route. Cool. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So you just deal with the girl, and then what happens upon belly? Yeah. The authorities or the girl and the family will decide. To. Yes, yes. So mm -hmm. um, do you do you help girls who um, who don't have parental figures or you help everyone like you know in terms of I am a teenage mom but I have parents or do you help those ones that they are teenage mothers but they don't have support for lack of a better word we, we don't we normally don't uh, select the ones we help because anyone who comes through our hands and we are able to actually help we help and uh, what I'll be able to say is that you find that even those who are having 
parental figures or parents, you find that sometimes parents give, give up on their children. So you find we have young mothers right now who are with us, but their parents don't even give up. What happens to mm. them? You know, they're, they're not even ready even just to talk to them. So you find sometimes the parents just take a back seat from the child's life. So for us, we don't select. We, we, don't, we don't discriminate. But for us, we currently we don't have a, a center, or rather we don't have a shelter where we can be able to house girls. So we normally support them remotely, if I may say that. So they normally come to our center or to the space where we have, then we do our sessions and they go back home. Okay. Uh, but that's how we, we are able to support mm. them. That was my next question yes. because I wanted to ask, wanted yeah. to ask you, yeah. do you have somewhere they can put up or uh -huh. it's a daily program mm -hmm. during the day? Yeah, How it's, effective it's, is it? It is still effective because like sometimes when I look at, uh, like now the current crop of girls we've been working with since February, I look at some of their videos when they were coming and their videos right now. I mean, they are whole different people. You know, you look at them and they're like, even they are, the way they're able to express themselves, they, the way they're able to <laughs> communicate, you find that this is someone who walked in without hope, someone who walked in with a veil of shame on their head, someone who walked in not knowing, okay, where exactly do I go? Because again, you see, we are saying that society castigates girls who are already pregnant. So you see, she walked in knowing that out there, people do not care about me. Mm. But in here, I have a space, a safe space, where I can get a hug, where people appreciate me, where I can be able to ask these questions, where I can be able to get this kind of help that I need. So yes, there's a lot of, there's a lot of difference by the time they walk in and the time they leave. So the bigger picture for us, of course, is to have a, a shelter or a center for the girls. So at least they can, we normally want to say that it's a one-stop shop. We at least they can come in, get the counseling that you're able to give, get mentorship. We can be able to give them uh, dignity kits. Our dignity kit is tailor-made for a teenage mother. The normal dignity kit has sanitary items only for a girl. But our current dignity kit has sanitary items both for the girl and the baby. So normally we add things like diapers and clothes and, you know, all that. Huh? So dignity kit. And she can be able to at least get some education. Because we have a few girls who have gone through uh, vocational training through sponsorship by several individuals and organizations. And uh, uh, essentially that is what we envision for them so that by the time they are, we are disconnecting with them and taking them out there, they can at least have some way in which they can be able to earn an income. Yes. Oh, wow. Yeah. I, was, I, was, I was almost wondering, uh, you mentioned dignity kit at first, I was like, dignity, dignity kits. So I, I wanted to say, what is dignity kit? And now that you've said what it, what, what it entails mm -hmm. inside, I was like, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Makes sense. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. So, um, wholesomely in terms of um content that you give um the girls what do you mainly teach them mm, mainly <laughs> or, or mainly. what do you just teach them mainly we teach them parenting because we realize that like there is a there is a there is a lot of there is a big parenting gap with young mothers because you realize this girl is a child who's been thrust into parenthood. So we teach them parenting. Some of them don't even know how to breastfeed well. Yeah. Some of them don't know proper nutrition. Some of them don't even know how to hold their babies. You know, so, and in the circle, because normally we do group, group training and group therapy, you find that as this one is doing this right, the other one is able to learn. So even just the group knowledge happens there. Yeah? So we teach them parenting, and parenting has many angles, nutrition, breastfeeding, you know, uh, caring for the baby, mental health issues, because you find some of them are already, they are already feeling depressed and all this. So mental health, how, do, how are they able to, going to be able to take care of themselves so that at least they can be able to take care of their mm. children. We teach a lot of self-awareness, self-esteem, um, communication skills, negotiation skills, sexual and reproductive health, all these things. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, quite, yeah. quite, quite comprehensive. Yeah. As, as we were sharing, I was thinking, is there, is there a time, particular time where um, this, this, this used to happen, Kitambo, I just want, I'm just asking out of curiosity, where you take in a girl, and then unachua mtoto, anapotea. Have you ever experienced that? One day. Ha! <laughs> 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 Let me 
baby seat and <laughs> 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 Okay, but it was not me who was left with the baby, but one day. This is one of the stories that has popped in my head when you've asked that. Um, one of the young mothers around the area that I work around, just, um, she's young, she's, she was very young, she was below 18, and uh, she was married to this guy, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, I think she was, she was undergoing postpartum depression, and uh, she, just, she just took the baby and left it with her neighbor. I'm coming. One minute, I'm coming. This is a sad story. You won't laugh after this. I'll <laughs> cry. That cry, I was asking people in the morning. It's about to yeah. catch me. <laughs> so, I'm coming in a few minutes. I'm, I'm coming. So, she just walked out. There's a road there. And she, she, she got knocked down by a girl. And she passed on. Ah. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. No. I even thought I was a daughter. No, no, she went and she passed on. So there are those cases. There are cases of girls. That right now, just on Saturday, we were having a discussion of a young girl who gave birth. I think she's around 16 or something. And uh, one, before she, she gave birth, she was trying to, you know, to procure an abortion, which did not, was not successful. Then now she's given birth. The baby is four, four, four days old. She's leaving the baby and going away. And disappearing. So yes, those cases are personally joy at your But there are so many cases around of family, friends who've been left with babies and girls just disappear because they are wondering what is this? How do I face this? You know, and probably postpartum depression is really real, especially at that age. And because most of the girls I work with, they are not within. They are within. They don't have a proper family structure or family support, which is really important. Yeah, which is really important. We still stuck up for you. We. I wanted to. I wanted to ask you something. Oh yeah, I've remembered this. Um, this story. Um, um there's this particular. Um, in this event where someone decides to give up their child for adoption, do you have such cases? Mm -hmm. Someone decides. We. I can't. Let me just give this child to the orphanage. Mm -hmm. Let them. Take, take care, care of the child. What happens mostly you find in the area that I work with, mostly you find that the girl does not just give up the child like that. You find that sometimes they deliver the child and they leave it in front of a children's home or a church. We have quite a number of, um, quite a number of facilities that are taking care of babies. So most of them just deliver the baby. They put it in a nice uh, gunia or something and they leave it at the door somewhere or in the kijiji somewhere and they just disappear. Yeah, so they, it's not like willingly I want to give up this child for adoption. It's just that they just abandon the baby. Yeah. Why though? I mean, come on. Picture this. Eh? You're 14. You live, you know, most of the girls I work with, they live in the low income areas. So you find that some of them, this is a very big house. Very big. So they are living in a very small house. Already the, the family is struggling with basic. There's, so poverty is, is really real for most of them. And you find that some of them are wondering, okay, fine, when I give birth to this child, what is going to happen? So normally their mental state is, you know, they are, they are feeling like they have actually hit the wall and they do not know where do I move, where do I go from here, you see. For me, I had the option of my parent, but for them, they don't have the option of my parent is going to support me. Yeah, so some of them, they just give up and because, again, even when they were expectant, they did not have a proper, proper support or probably proper, you know, a proper, someone to just give them some direction or, or the options, mm -hmm. as we say. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Hey, people are out here, they're suffering. Kai. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's, let's shift gears a bit from, from birth and beyond. Why did you choose to do, to do accounting? Why, why did you choose banking? I mean, they're two different things. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in fact, I did not choose banking. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a technical teacher. I'm a graduate technical teacher. Yes, I saw that too. Yes. I was coming there. So by the time I was graduating many years back huh, from technical training, um, there was a backlog of teachers who had not been employed. So going for interviews, some of the people who had graduated before us will get like 15, 20 marks above us. So by the time you'll get a chance to, you know, to even get that job, you know, it really took us time before we were employed by TSC. 
So I have sold out there as a private teacher in private schools, and you and I know, especially in some of those places, the salary, the, nini, the perks are not very good. So by the time I got the offer to join the banking sector, the microfinance sector, I mean, I was like, yes, please bring it on. So I found myself in a space that I got to love and a job that I got to enjoy. And especially because it had a lot of autonomy, I could be able to make decisions on my own. It was that these are your targets. These are the means to achieve your target. So long as you achieve your targets, we are good to go. So for me, I found that kind of an environment really, really friendly. And that is how I found myself doing nine years in that sector. But after nine years, I felt, oh, I can't do it again. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you were doing, you were doing um, uh, that alongside the Bath and Beyond? No. You, Bath and Beyond, Uleka Chini Kidogo? Um, I started Bath and Beyond. The dream, the thought, the name, the, the, the strategy, the was concept was all in my mind since 2011. I left the banking sector in 2016. So before that, it was just dreams, me thinking, okay, what do I do? I have so many books I've written. These are the strategies. This is what I'll do, nini, nini, like that. But I never really, really started. If anything, before 20, 2019, the only thing I did probably, I'll visit a girl somewhere who is expectant or who is pregnant or who is, has given birth. And I'll not know even what to say or what to do. Probably I'll just give diapers or something. But then, so I had a lot of false starts before 2019. But actually now starting, I started in 2019, way, at, way after I'd already left the banking sector. So when I was in the banking sector, it was just, I had focus, just focused on my work and just serving and just doing exactly what I was required to do. But again, I still had the dream. I still had the vision and the desire. What well, as we, I'm actually being told time is not over, so I'm like, wow, how did time just fly like that? Yeah. So as we bring this discussion to a close, um, what do you think? What will you say is the great is the greatest uh, challenge right now for you running Bath and Beyond, and also for the teenage mothers? Mm. What I'll say for any startup program, the main challenge is people don't believe in your dream until they actually see it. So when you're starting out, you're mostly on your own. You're mostly just with friends. Sometimes even family, they wonder, okay, fine. What, yeah. what exactly, what exactly, you what exactly are you doing? You know. So there, there is that that support sometimes lacks, especially at the startup stages. So for me, it's been really almost an uphill task. But what I'll say is that. And I would want to thank my partners and supporters because I've had a lot of friends who've really stood by me this far. So that really, for me, just being able to have people believe in the dream and partner with me, that was the greatest challenge. But going forth, just being able to upscale uh, the programs you're having, being able, like now the girls, we are graduating, they're around 10, and just having to fundraise for them just to go to vocational school, that again is you know a challenge for us. So we are out there just looking for partners, people who are willing to take them back to school for vocational training and so forth and so forth. So just supporting our programs, that would be for us one of the greatest challenges and one of the things we'd really love to do. For the teenage mothers, what I'll say is that one, we, uh, our society needs to accept that teenage mothers are here with us. And uh, from statistics, I want to say that every day in developing countries, Kenya being one, is that 20,000 girls give, give birth daily. So by close of business today, 20,000 girls would have given birth. And in a year, that is 7.8 million brought by teenage mothers alone. So you realize that if as societies we do not do the right thing, putting in structures that are going to support that parenting group, we need to realize that teenage mothers are here with us and we need to put in proper structures to be able to support them to bring up their children. So that means away from the homes, we need to deal with poverty, we need to deal with period poverty, we need to deal, in our schools, we need to put proper structures to be able to support teenage mothers when they come back to school. What programs can we be able to create for them to be able to learn how to breastfeed, giving them proper timetables to go back to breastfeed their children and so on and so forth. In our hospitals, how are we treating them? Are we treating them that the girls are the ones who made the mistake yet? The child was con conceived by two people. So again, as a society, in churches, what are we doing to support teenage mothers? So I think that is the greatest challenge, that we need to put in structures all over the society to be able to support teenage mothers because, again, the problem is here with us and we are not wishing it away today or tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah. 
Hi, it's it's just sad. It gets somewhere and you're like, wow, yeah. these things are happening. They are. And I'm like, now that you're saying it, the way you've expressed it, and you're saying that we need to know that teenage mothers are here with us, so we deal with it. Yeah, we need to. And deal I'm like, that's that's one of the parts society has not made peace with. Yes. The part here, they are here to stay. Yeah. So guys, mm. put your mind up yes. for it. Yeah. Oof, please give us a parting shot. I'm still processing <laughs> everything. Please give <laughs> us a parting shot. Ah, uh, what parting shot do I give? That in our own spaces, wherever we are, let us support young mothers and teenage mothers. And let, let, us not, let us not be quick to judge them because you do not know how and, you know, what brought them to that space. So there is something we can be able to do. And normally I say that even if you give a simple hug to a young mother, it, it's really, really just enough for them. And, uh, you know, just reach out to a young mother near you, be able to support her. Anything you can be able to give diapers are very expensive. Even take her just a mm -hmm. packet of diapers and I think you'll really have done something to be able to help someone in the community and, you know, you'll be able to have shi shined a light to a young mother out there. Thank yeah. you so much, Thank Patricia. You. Thank yeah. you for coming. Thank, Thank you. you for sharing. Yeah. Um, I'm left thinking. I'm left thinking and being grateful for the things I have. You know, at times yeah. we take a lot of yeah. things for yeah, granted, yeah. and I'm so grateful. Thank you for making time to Thank come and talk to me. us. Yeah, yes, that yes. was Patricia and Jerry. Where, <laughs> guys? Yes, well, in Lulisa's Buisdri, come and meet your victim, Sasa. But Patricia, if you didn't get her introduction, is a founder and director of Bath and Beyond, a program that deals with teenage mothers. And we have had a lengthy discussion about the parks and, you know, everything, everything until around surrounding teenage mothers, the challenges they face and everything around it. And, you know, it's quite a lot. You see one out there, be kind to Mambiwa, hug one and be nice to them. But before I get all emotional and crying, that was the strength of a woman. In case you got that interview halfway or in case you got the discussion, you, you're getting to get the discussion, uh, the discussion sidelines, you will see it on our social media handles. Uh, that is on our YouTube channel at Y254 channel. But right now, that was strength of a woman for this week. Do not touch that dial.